Right, okay, so I suppose the title is, is quite explanatory, really. Positive action with a 3D printer in a museum. So what I'm really interested in is, if you've seen over there with the 3D prints I have, um, I'm actually interested to see how these could actually benefit a visitor interpretation of art, a visitor interpretation of archaeology. I'm interested in not just putting 3D objects, 3D models, at one side and saying, interpret this yourself and having nothing else around it. I'm interested in the 3D models being an addition to the current museum interpretation. So being next to the object exhibited, having the usual museum interpretation, like the text or maybe photos, and then having the model. So it's the addition of the tactile dynamic, the, the touchy-feely stuff, really. So anyway, um, so really to begin with, I suppose I've, I've covered this and we've all just discussed this. Four, real, four main points, really, about the use of 3D models benefiting the, um, the appreciation of the original artifact, not just the model itself, but people, visitors, participants, they are willing to actually project that onto the artifact itself, and they become, in, I've found out through my data collection, that they become interested in the actual artifact. They are willing to go and seek out this original for their confirmation, their review will, and then come back and criticize and offer a critique, which I will tell you about a case later on. Uh, so again, just in the addition of this tactile stimulation and being able to handle an object in a museum, it's quite a simple thing to say, but privileged. The, the participant feels privileged. It's privileged access, it's private access. Again, when I was doing my data collection, uh, when I was at the Winchester School of Art, and people were handling a 3D model that I made, it was a fragment of a mammoth tusk, their hands were shaking, which was absolutely amazing. They, became ner they actually became nervous because they were treating this as the actual artifact. It was, it was a proxy, really. However, before I discuss all of this, I need to give you a bit of background information, but from the people I've been talking about, it seems like you all really know what 3D printing is. So, I won't stay too long. This is sort of the method which I went about these things. So, in my talk, I, in this talk, I'm going to talk to you about the data collection I've cut, or part of my data collection that I've covered for my thesis. So, there's only two little, two little parts of this data collection. One was held in a museum, one was held in two museums, and one was held in the Winchester School of Art. So, again, 3D printing, as you can see here, this is my home setup. 3D printing is the ability of a 3D printer to create a physical model, uh, previously a physical model that actually was previously held as a digital model on a computer or a laptop. So this is my setup in the Dorset County Museum. Um, as you see here, I have three, the 3D scanner, next to the 3D scanner, my laptop at the top there, and then these are the processes I went through. So again, with post-processing, readying this for 3D printing, as you can see, the up here builds the model up one layer at a time. So if you actually go and scrutinize one of the same wear pots there, you could probably see the striations, the way this is actually built up. And then I have different iterations, all of which are there, and all of which I do recommend you pick up, handle, but please don't put them in your pocket and walk off with them. <laughs> um, so, there are many different types of 3D printing, and I shan't bore you with them all now. Um, but the one that I have favoured for my research, um, which I considered more, most accessible and most visitor-friendly in a way, was fused filament fabrication. So you actually can see this here. This is where you have a reel of you have a reel of plastic or a reel of any material. It is fed through a heated nozzle there, which is essentially, essentially a soldering iron, and then deposited on a moving platform. So this is built up over time. <coughs> so you have these fused films of fabrication, saving wear pots, but right at the end, this is made out from another, from another method of 3D printing called LOM, laminate object manufacturing. This is one layer upon layers upon layers of paper built up over time, glued together and actually physically cut out. This produces a nice model, this, although this one's rather bland, 
but a, a bulky model, which I <coughs> wanted for my visual, tactile, and tactile experiments later on to provide me with comparative data. Anyway, so, uh, just a little bit of background information, because um, if you read The New Scientist in 1974, you would have come across <laughs> an article <laughs> called, where in which 3D printing was called a rapid polymerization technique. So it's been around at least since 1974. People were talking about this at the end of the Second World War. So again, longer than you think. But really, for what we're using, came about sort of subject to various patterns in the 1980s, that sort of thing, 1984. Um, and then the one that we're using, fused filament fabrication, FFF, or fused deposition modeling, as it's sometimes called. Anyway, the real meat of the thing, I suppose, is why apply this to a museum? Again, I'm probably speaking to the converted here. I don't know. Um, because, again, for a museum to apply this, to apply 3D printing, 3D scanning, this technology, there are many different, there are various um, benefits to the museum, like in uh, storage, archives, income generation, that sort of thing. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just on the vista focused exhibitions. But, again, it, subject to some of the literature I've come across recently, I don't apply this because I can, because it's the gee whiz, fantastic, wonderful technology. Um, like, uh, because, again, that's the wrong idea. I'm looking for the long term, how this could actually benefit visitor uh, uh, appreciation or interpretation of archaeology in the long term, not the short term. If you just want a nice press release out of this, again, you're perhaps looking at the short term. Uh, there's so much more. This is a lot about selection. How you in the museum actually apply this technology is, is more useful than actually getting your hands on this technology to begin with. Okay, um, and then of course, introduction of a new dynamic for engagement. This the sort of tactile interaction, which again, for a museum, it's, I suppose, going back to the original idea of touching the original objects, your contact from Klassen and various historians and people like that. However, right, I should perhaps tell you, in my data collection, in part of my data collection, museums, one was held for uh, one day on each venue, two museums, the Winchester City Museum, so thank you to Rob Niles for that, and the uh, Dorset County Museum also. Um, I had 42 people uh, for my data collection, but out of 42 people, I got one negative respondent, which again, at least he was negative all the way through the activity. <laughs> um, so again, as you can see, he quite liked the, this person actually quite liked the fact that this, or quite liked saying that this looked throwaway, looked like something a child may have made, and in fact, I like this one, if this was, would you return to the museum? No, because it would no longer be a museum. However, this highlights the sort of idea, the, the, the idea that I came across in certain quarters that it would be the addition of this technology would actually be used as a sort of um, an excuse to get rid of the original artifacts and just have print after print after print, after, uh, 3D model after model after whatever and just say, engage with these, the artifacts are somewhere else, don't bother. But again, that's not what I want to do. That's not actually what I want to do. This is a useful highlight into the problem, into the pitfalls, but again, it is an aside. So, I've been saying this for a while, the main meat of the thing. So real, really, two main questions. Can tactile interaction with this 3D benefit the understanding of the original? And uh, is interpretation resulting from tactile only interaction unfocused? Is this resulting in just people guessing about the artifact? So, these are actually two 3D models, as you see. <coughs> One is a same in Ware Pot, uh, currently exhibited at the Dorset County Museum, and the other one is it's called the Taurus Trigorenus, currently exhibited at the Dorset County Museum. I'm not employed by the Dorset County Museum. Just so you know. But these objects and the data collected are absolutely fantastic. And they all seem to result from these two artefacts. Um, anyway, start with the first question. 
This is how the, if you want to know, the original Sami were not. That's how this is actually exhibited, or it was about six years ago anyway. This was exhibited as a number of funerary items where you have various other saving wear pots, you have urns, you have beads, funerary gifts, that sort of thing. And this is just really described as a saving vessel. So in the archaeology gallery, it is really blink and you will miss it. Unless you are really interested in saving wear pots, you're not really going to pay much attention. So that's why I chose this. Because again, the lighting's perhaps not so brilliant, but you can sort of see some definition you'll be able to touch the definition down there. You, will, you can see figures, you can see other things, you can see spears, pine cones, that sort of thing. And so, again, to touch this, what would you actually learn? What would you actually get out of this? So, again, this is what I did for the data collection. Uh, so in the museums, I had 42 participants, non-specialists. And then for my tactile-only experiments, which I used this part in the Winchester School of Art, um, I got people to close their eyes. I had 12 people. And you'll be pleased to know, everyone in the visual tactile experiments identified the same in wear pot as a pot, which is good. <laughs> so, going to tactile, uh, going to actual tactile only, I used the same in wear pots as a, um, I used the same in wear pot as a, as an experiment for, or as an excuse really, to scale up the object. So I did a, used a two-scale version of the Sami Ware and then a 1.5 scale version of the Sami Ware. I, with my printer, I couldn't actually get any bigger. Otherwise, I would have to physically glue the object together from the printer and that would cause extra definition, extra lumps and bumps and grooves. So again, I wanted to print the thing as a whole. So again, using these 12 participants for these tactile-only experiments, People, I was quite astounded, because really, just with this little jump uh, from 1 to 1.5, people could actually identify few, there are a smaller range of shapes. They could actually crystallize their, uh, their own in interpretation in a way. This provided me with more defined range. So I asked people to count the count shapes on there, which is, of course, unfair, because it's tactile only and... It's just unfair. So I gave them a little bit of a range. This was narrowed, and then with a higher scaling, this was further. This was actually further narrowed, which again was interesting, particularly since this provided me with the other information, where these sort of abstract lines, bumps, zigzagged things, this was actually defined as ripples, fish, and later on pine cone. The reason I put this person down here is the fact that no one touching this actually knew that they were going to touch a scaled up version of the same pot. But this person, during the interaction, again eyes closed, asked, is this a scaled up version of the same pot? Maybe this is because they're from the Winchester School of Art, and of course art students may be a pot or something. But Again, it's interesting because they specifically singled out the zigzag as becoming pine cones. So again, something abstract becomes concrete. However, I also asked, asked many things, but I asked one question, which one did you like the most of and why after two things? These were in the tactile only experiments. But again, one was they'd engage with the objects, they answered my questions, I asked this question, they still, the participants still had their eyes closed, and the objects were exactly where they'd put them on the desks. They found them on the desk, um, where the, the participant found them on the desk, by them. They picked them up as if to review them, still closing their eyes, and then gave a rather considered answer, liking that rather bland one there, the long the land object, object manufacturing, the paper pot. Because again, the reason was weight. It was the heaviest. And on, answer, and on asking this, weight gives it authenticity. However, I then asked this again when they opened their eyes. I'd laid the pots out in front of them. And but then they still did the same. Um, went, to review the, went to review the pots and um, <coughs> went to review the pots, but instead 
change, most of them change their answers. Um, indeed, from common, most of them, most of the participants commented that this was rather bland. and said change their idea to something with a colour. So it looked rather with a colour, so it looked rather nice. And um, a nice texture also. So again, colour and texture play a part when visual stimuli is, is put in, position, in play. But anyway, go on to the next one rather briefly. Okay, so the Taras Trigorades. The original one, Dorset County Museum. Um, the, the way it's exhibited, um, you're not able to see what it's actually described as a three-horned bull. It has three horns. You can't see it there, and you can't actually see it the way that I've taken the photo. And that's not just pure luck. That is actually the fact that I did it on purpose. Um, that's because, by the way, if you're just visually engaging with this, the most prominent feature of this, the three horns, is the least prominent. But if you're touching the object, if you're tactically engaged with the object, the least prominent, you think, becomes the most prominent. Everyone knows this has got three horns. Every one of the 42 participants and the 12 others, they realised this had three horns. So anyway, what is it? I didn't expect anyone for visual tactile experiments in museums to even know what it was. So, this is what I asked them. Then I asked them to actually interpret the object. Uh, again, the majority out of the 42, an animal. There were three options. They gave boar goat cap. I didn't define anything. This is what they gave. But everyone sort of gravitated to these. However, if you go a bit further down, you can see their interpretations crystallizing a little bit. Because with further questioning, uh, they focused, I asked them, where do you think the original came from? They focused, again, more on classical civilizations, uh, the top two being ancient Greece and Rome. Then I gave them a range, much longer than this one, 20,000 BC to 1800 AD. Um, again, the range given was huge. But, again, this was focused with the majority out of the 42 participants, focusing between 300 BC to 100 AD, the Roman Empire, perhaps. So again, it's these people not just guessing about interpretation, but also using, using their own education and inferring from experience as well as previous, as well as, um, previous objects seen to actually apply this and interpret the object. Right. So with tactile, I developed this slightly with tactile only, and really, I answered, I asked similar questions. So, this was identified as people just handling this, animal, sculpture, <coughs> and humans on top. Again, humans on top is quite interesting. Um, but again, there they are. The least prominent feature for visual becomes one of the, mo one of the most prominent anyway, when you're handling this. Um, Every, it was very interesting because people orientated, people actually orientated this object, uh, held this in the palm of their hand, orientated this, and also, once orientated, found, who found the legs, commented on the legs, actually put this on the desk, on the bubble wrap, tried to balance this on the bubble wrap, of course, naive pursuit. When this fell over, there was a little knock, and they smiled, which Call me old-fashioned, but I attribute smiling to actually enjoyment. And enjoyment is good for learning. It's pedagogi pedagogically sound, I suppose. Anyway, however, one person, one person did orientate this, but the wrong way up. Crab claw. Which, I suppose, if you use your imagination with the legs and the ornamentation, it does sort of seem like a crab claw with the pincers. But again, everyone's going to interpret something differently. But you've got to realise, and I'm sure you've already thought this, in a museum people aren't going to close their eyes and go like that. So again, this is a good guide, but the previous visual tactile uh, interpretation, that's the most important for you, I suppose. Anyway, this is really the most important thing for, um, for museums, because I've entitled this the three-part exploratory activity. And when this came about, I was completely flabbergasted, really. Because, again, that was a 3D model. You can see it down there. But people actually, they saw it, 
uh, participants at the Dorset County Museum, they actually, they actually saw this being printed when it was ready. They were able to handle this. They answered my questionnaire about the various bits and bobs. Um, but no one, knew, no one who um, answered these questionnaires previously knew that this was the Tower's Trigger Angel or Three Horned Bull. And no one knew that this was exhibited in the museum. But a very overly helpful volunteer uh, <laughs> told one person that this was actually exhibited in the museum. This went around the group of people who were coming in all day. And so this actually resulted in groups of people throughout the day actually, after they answered my questionnaire, handled this, going off, going around the museum. I was in the Great Hall, which is a normal Victorian sort of thing. But in the archaeology gallery of the Dorset County Museum, so around the, around the gallery, up the stairs, around into the archaeology gallery, quite dark and dingy part of the archaeology gallery anyway, they found the original Paris <coughs> Trinoranus, made notes, so note-taking was involved. They took photographs, digital cameras, phones were used, and one person actually wrote down physical notes. They came back, the important thing is they came back to me, they came back, they handled the object again, then they offered their critique, which was <laughs> positive or negative, it was both. Because again, that's fantastic. They thought from a little activity like that, they actually thought it was, it was worth their while to go and expend this energy and meet other people along the way. In fact, when they came back, again, they all went, they'd all originally gone in groups together, twos or threes, they, they came back, they offered the critique, not just to me, but to people in the other group, who fortunately already answered the questionnaire, but um, people, people milling about. They talked to them. This got them to socialize. This got them to educate other people, tell them that this was actually on exhibit in the gallery. It's not just something that you're going to pass by with all the same in wear pots and the little book. You are actually going to physically look for that. So again, I was completely, I was, I was bored over by it. That actually people bothered to do this. And they thought it was worth their time and their, their effort. Anyway, so as I've probably already told you, participants are not guessing this is focused. Um, from the Tower Graves, no one, of course, knew originally what the bull was, what the whole thing was going to be, what it was. And in fact, through this tactile only or visual tactile interpretation, they took interpretive cues from points of ref from various points of reference. Um, so again, the, these points of reference they all added to one conclusion at the end. Most people they gave me a variety of answers, but over time these answers narrowed down their conclusions focused on one thing. Was this an animal with emperors, that sort of thing? Was it part of a bridal gift? Was it... Anyway, so again, orientation infect, affects interpretation, as we saw with the tactile-only interpretation. Um, and uh, visual tactile interpretation is not dependent on familiarity, but again, how they can apply their education and their previous experiences to narrow down, to focus down their interpretation. People simply won't see something and think, oh, that's fantastic. They might hold the 3D model and think, oh, that's fantastic. I don't really care what it is, but I think it is blah de blah de blah No, they care about the object. If they didn't care about the object, people wouldn't have got nervous to begin with when handling the, art of, when handling the 3DM, or they wouldn't have given me the reactions of, wow, fantastic, awesome. I mean, awesome. But anyway, <laughs> awesome is awesome, I suppose. Right, so what can we learn from this? Something in an, I should have put in a Venn diagram, really, because there's so much overlap. Uh, so you can see the individual focuses on the 3DM in the hand. You, a person will always focus on what's in their hand. It's only natural. When something's in your hand, you will automatically interpret this. Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it smooth? Is it round? Is it, you will look at the shape. You will focus on the texture. Um, this is something you can't stop. You can't interpreting touch. You can't stop interpreting touch. It is 
something that's omnipresent. It is your interpretation is effortless in a way. It is oh, and this dictates the amount of effort that you actually want to put into this. Uh, so again, this leads you to the identification of certain details or how you elaborate on this because of your private privileged access to the actual object. So, as we've seen, people judge this as worthwhile. The participants, not just the participants, but everyone in my data collection, people that I've encountered, they actually like handling activities. And so they judge these things as worth their so they judge these things as worth their while. Then in the ta like in the Taurus trigger rings, or with the same inware pot, or the same inware vessel, or whatever you want to call it, they then check it out to review the object. Check it out to actually review the object. I go to another part of the museum, see the original, see the artifact, or pick up the pots to, to, to gauge which one they prefer. So they review the object. And then they come back to confirm, take their notes, expend their energy and judge it and deem it worth their time to do all this. So, my last thing, a little simple diagram that I did a, a few months ago. Um, of course, as we've seen, the distance between the museum vista and the 3DM can be great. Yeah, as long, can be within, as long as it's within the same building. Um, within the same building, within a proximity anyway. And so, again, this is the little link. You as the museum visitor, you stand there, you look, you scrutinize at the artifact, you press your nose against the, the glass, that sort of thing, but you can't get so close to it. Your visual interpretation of it is dependent on the time you want to spend staring at it, or your effort you want in to scrutinize it. And indeed, it is your appreciation of the artifact is also limited on your interpretation of the the text, your comprehensive abilities uh, of the text or the photographs provided. So again, for 3DM, right next to the original, right next to the artifact. Again, this is, the 3D model is an interpretation, is another expression in which it's open for a museum to experiment with whatever material that they want to use. But again, there are so many benefits that can fall the museum that can be placed, that can be used by the museum, and it's all really down to selection. Selection by the museum's professional and how they actually apply this technology. Um, so anyway, just in case, if you're interested, that's my very short bibliography. Uh, anyway, okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions?